Um, hi everyone, I'm uh, Jean-Marie Robert. I'm an instructor at Nate, and uh, I was asked pretty last minute to do this talk, so I threw something together, and hopefully we can learn a bit about heat pumps. Um, heat pumps is a topic that I get asked about all the time. Um, I argue with people over, I get yelled at, and I'm still here. Um, just some information about me. I'm uh, from Nate, and I teach mostly building science stuff, HVAC things for the Alternative Energy Program uh, at Nate. So when I start talking about heat pumps, a lot of the time, people's eyes kind of glaze over and find it a pretty boring topic. And uh, I'm here to tell you guys that this could actually be an interesting topic, and heat pumps can be quite dapper. Um, so I have a couple examples of heat pumps here. So this one here, very nicely dressed. And uh, another George Clooney-esque heat pump here. All right, so heat pumps are great. Um, so my hope here is just to cover a couple things. So why heat pumps, what are heat pumps, a little bit how they work, and I have a small case study of, um, I took my house, I did an energy model on it, and I threw it in Edmonton, left bridge in a high level, and just looked at what a heat pump would do for that particular building and how it might work. Um, so number one, why heat pumps. Um, in this graph, oh, the blue color is amazing. It looked better on my computer screen. Um, <clears throat> it's because it's an apple. That's what this one is. Um, so just long story short here, uh, the, the energy consumption by sector here in Canada is roughly a third on the building side. So a large portion of our energy consumption comes from buildings. It's not just for driving or uh, you know, industrial processes. And again, the colors change from my initial spreadsheet. Um, and on this one here, what we're seeing is the blue curve and the, the orange curve is the energy consumed in a residential building for domestic, just heating, heating the building and for domestic hot water. So the majority of our consumption is just heating and hot water. So a lot of times people think, I'm gonna do a retrofit, I will change all my incandescent light bulbs to LEDs, and I am done. All right, so obviously a lot of our, our money that we spend and the energy we consume is just to heat stuff in our buildings, and heat pumps can accomplish all these things. The space cooling is tiny here, but the heat pumps can also do the space cooling. On the commercial side, the numbers change a little bit, but still heating and cooling is a major factor on there. Um, so to wean off of fossil fuels, we've had this theme tonight, we'll keep on going with this. Uh, we have to electrify our energy services. We can talk about you know, how our grid works and grid connections and stresses on the grids and we're you know, consuming electricity that's produced by natural gas and so on. That's not my point for tonight. I'm just gonna say that we are able to produce the heat uh, with electricity and we can use renewables uh, for that. Um, so here's just a graph that shows, or a picture that shows I'm able to produce power right on my house using solar panels, for example, so local electricity. I am not able to make natural gas in vast enough quantities, I guess. <laughs> um, what exactly is a heat pump? So a heat pump really is just a machine that moves heat. It's a pump for heat, that's it. Just like you would have a pump for water. Um, we have them in our homes already, so refrigerators, freezers, uh, air conditioners are all examples of heat pumps. We don't call them heat pumps, I don't know why, we just give them those other names. So a refrigerator, for example, takes the heat from inside the box and throws it in your kitchen. So it's actually a kitchen heater is what it is. And the consequence is the inside of the box gets cold. So our air conditioner is the same thing. It takes the heat from inside the house, throws it outside, it cools our house. So it warms up the outside is really the objective of that. So a heat pump just has a valve in there that swaps the orientation of the heating. So the air conditioner you have in your house has an outdoor unit let see right here. Um, it interacts with the outside. We take the heat from inside, it throws it out. We flip the reversing valve, it just swaps those two coils. The inside coil becomes warm and we're able to move the heat from the outside to the inside in the winter. So that's the perp the, just the way they work. How do they work? Well, traditionally a home looks like this. This is my architectural skills, by the way. If you want the details, I will provide them. Um, so here's a, just a hypothetical situation. We have an inside temperature of roughly 20 degrees, outside is minus 10, so the heat is just gonna flow from the inside to the outside of the building. As long as we're able to supplement the heat on the inside at the same rate, our inside temperature stays constant and we're happy. Um, traditionally, this is done by burning stuff, right? So burning wood, burning fossil fuels, burning whatever we want. So as long as that rate is there, uh, we'll be comfortable. So think about being in a teepee that has no insulation whatsoever. As long as the fire is burning on the inside, everybody's comfortable in there. So what we're gonna do now is instead of burning things, we're gonna install a heat pump. 
So the heat pump goes in between the two sets and it essentially just takes the heat from the minus 10 degree side and shoves it in the plus 20 side. And at minus 10, there's not much heat in the air, you would think, but there's about 85% of the heat that we have at this, oops, I don't have a mouse here, at this plus 20 side. Um, so the way they work is we have two coils, one on the inside and one on the outside. And inside those coils, there's a refrigerant that just flows in circles. And it's all powered by a compressor. And we see the compressor over here. Um, I'm not going to get into all the physics of it. That's not super important. Just long story short, one side is cold, the other side is hot. Now, as long as the cold coil is colder than the cold side, I think I have a picture here. Let's say it's minus 50 degrees. The heat will go from the minus 10 to the minus 50. So we can take the heat from the cold minus 10 air and put it in the refrigerant. It goes through the compressor where it gets upgraded to a different temperature. These temperatures are made up by the way, so don't, it's not a real heat pump. I just made it up just for illustrative purposes. Um, <clears throat> as long as the hot side is hotter than the inside, then the heat will go into the building. Okay, so that's all it is. It's just as simple as that. Um, the trick is to find the refrigerant that will do the job and the pressures at which it will work properly. Um, good thing we have some great engineers in the world. So essentially the heat goes from the outside to the refrigerant, from the refrigerant to the house. So we're pumping heat from the cold side to the hot side, okay? So it's a big magical box and it works spectacular. In the summertime is the same thing. We flip the valve, the cold side becomes hot, the hot side becomes cold. We, as long as the hot coil is hotter than the outside, we're gonna get the heat to go from the, oh, I'll go, go this way here. So the heat's gonna go from the inside to the coil, to the coil to the other side, and then the heat just travels through. We're able to cool the building, okay? So in rough estimation here, the heat pump is just moving heat from the cold side to the hot side of the building. Um, here's just a picture with the reversing valve. We're not able to move those coils physically, so we just do that with a valve on the inside. All right, so I wanted to rip through this because it's only 10, 20 minutes. Um, now, what do heat pumps actually look like? Um, there's a lot of different variations of heat pumps from ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, and different configurations of those heat pumps as well. Um, I just have two systems here to show you guys. I have a mini duct, duct sorry, ductless mini splits, which are essentially an outdoor unit. And then we pump the refrigerant to a spot in your house and you can heat or cool um, different zones. Also have some central systems. So this one here, for example, uh, the Daikin one on the left for me, right for you guys, um, essentially has a hair handler that goes where your furnace is. And it's just like your air conditioner, the coil can be hot or cold, so we can heat or cool with it. Um, there's also monoblock systems and all kinds of different systems like that. Um, do they work in Edmonton? So they do work in Edmonton. There are plenty of houses in Edmonton that do have heat pumps. So most of them are high performance houses that require smaller loads. Um, these are two examples. Uh, one of them from a presentation from earlier, Jim's house, um, the one on, the, on that side, um, which is a Toso heat pump. And then this one here is one of my friend's house. This one was built, I think it was about 15 or 16 years ago. So this is not a cold climate heat pump and he runs this one all winter long, even at minus 20. Uh, the efficiencies are pretty not great on it, but it still heats the house fine. <clears throat> he also has electric backup, and I uh, have a picture of the inside of the house here where you can see uh, it looks like a regular furnace. It's an air handler with an electric furnace, backup heat, and uh, it's got an HRV in there. You see the heat recovery for the water, um, all kinds of fun stuff. So long story short, they exist in Edmonton. They're heating those houses perfectly fine, and there's no issues from them. The new cold climate heat pumps can heat down to minus 30 uh, at almost full capacity, which is quite great. The efficiencies do go down a little bit, but uh, it's not too terrible. So where do the heat pumps get their efficiencies from? So the efficiency is essentially a measure of how much heat we get for how much energy we put in. <clears throat> so a standard furnace, this is what this one is, um, we talk about 95% efficiency furnace. What does that mean? Well, for every unit of energy we burn, let's say one gigajoule of natural gas, some of that heat needs to go up the chimney because we're exhausting carbon dioxide and other gases. So that stuff going up the chimney brings heat with it, say 5% of that energy. So that's why we have only 95% of the heat going into the house. So we call that 95% efficient. Um, for resistive heat, that's just electric baseboard, not common in Alberta, but in other jurisdictions, we see quite a bit of those. Um, the efficiency is 100%. So for every kilowatt of electricity we put in the system, we get one kilowatt of heat out of the system. So it's 100% efficient in that sense. When we start talking about efficiencies in heat, it's tricky because in traditional systems, um, 
heat is a waste product, right? So uh, in this case, we can get 100% efficient that way. What a heat pump does is it consumes electricity. So the electricity is running the compressor, which drives the whole system. So that unit of electricity, let's say one kilowatt to run the heat pump, will then pull one kilowatt of heat from the outside cold air. So those two units of energy together gives me two. So for every one kilowatt of electricity, I get one kilowatt of free heat out of the air. I get two units of heat out. So we call that a COP of two or a 200% efficiency is the term that we end up using. Um, so that's where that comes from. So free heat like that. For ground source heat pumps, they get even better because of the ground temperatures are more stable. Uh, we get efficiencies of four, four and a half, five, somewhere in that range. Okay, so we get three free units for every one unit of electricity we consume. So what are advantages of heat pumps? Well, number one, the on-site energy consumption is dropped. So if we say that the heat pump system has a COP of two on average, that means that if I'm currently consuming 100 gigajoules of natural gas to heat up my space, I'll consume something around 50 gigajoules of electricity on site. Okay, now obviously it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. We don't pay the same price for one gigajoule of natural gas and one gigajoule of electricity, but we still consume less in terms of energy um, directly like that. Um, for ground source heat pumps, that number is four times less, which is quite good. And I'm just talking about heating on the cooling side, the numbers are quite different. Um, this can also translate to financial savings in the sense of consuming less electricity. Depending on the jurisdiction, we might save money. So for example, if you're in BC and you're already heating your house with baseboard heating, you're automatically cutting your bill in half because you're paying for the same electricity. It's really quick. In jurisdictions like Edmonton, we have different fuels. We already talked about the uh, ju only jurisdiction where uh, they don't pay off air source heat pumps is Edmonton for the simple fact that um, the, spark back, the spark gap is so big. The cost of natural gas is very, very low. Um, all this is changing though, as our grid is, is getting better and greener, um, those things may change. Now, if I could predict the future, I'd bet on it, but for now, uh, that's kind of what we're, we're looking at. <clears throat> um, there are highly flexible systems, as we already talked about as well. Um, if I wanna replace my furnace just for heating, they will heat, but they also serve as your air conditioner. So most people right now always already say, well, 6,000 bucks for a furnace, uh, but you're paying also another 6,000 for your air conditioner, it's a $12,000 system. So if you wanna replace that with a heat pump, now you're comparing apples to apples, right? So the two systems put together. Uh, we can use heat pumps for domestic hot water as well. Um, if you're using ground source heat exchangers, those ones will produ produce the water, the heat, the cooling, everything all in one shot. So there's different systems available there. They're available for all building types. You can do forced air, hydronics, whatever you want. So they're hyper flexible systems. Um, there are air to water systems, just like there's water to water systems and so on. Um, in terms of safety and health, uh, we have no combustion on site now, so we can get rid of our natural gas, so we're not worried about things like carbon monoxide. Um, and yeah, so that's good for the indoor air quality and just the overall experience of the user. Um, other things are comfort. Um, the heat produced by heat pumps is a lower temperature than you have with um, um, furnaces, so you get this nice low constant heat that you can just produce all the time. Um, and you can also use it for humidity control in the summertime. If you don't have an air conditioner, then you don't have access to that humidity control. Um, so lots of advantages, I can go on and on and on about them, but I wanted to jump a little bit into the challenges because this is where uh, the tropes kind of come in and people just say, well, there's this, and then they stop talking to me, right? That's the end of the story with these heat pumps. So one of the major challenges with heat pumps is the sizing. So currently, when people are sizing furnaces, you get the idea of the house is, is yay big, therefore I'm gonna put a furnace yay big, and the furnace is always super oversized. So a lot of people think I have an 80,000 BTU furnace, I'm gonna to have to put an 80,000 BTU heat pump, and that's rarely the case. These things are often oversized. Um, oversizing a heat pump does lead to lower efficiencies. It's gonna short cycle, short, lessen the life of the system, so we have to really pinpoint what the size is. If it's undersized, then it's not producing the heat that we want. And this is when we get the complaints of, oh, the heat pumps don't work. So maybe that's just a sizing issue from the contractor or, or anything else like that. Um, so that's a big, big issue there. Um, other things that exacerbate this problem is heat pumps often don't come in uh, fractional tonnage. 
So you, maybe you can get a three ton or a four ton, but you can't find the three and a half ton. So there's always that little issue. And as you get to smaller and smaller loads, um, it gets even worse. Um, so there's, there's that problem with them. So what I wanted to do is discuss the cold climate. So this is really where we are living in Edmonton. Um, when you're looking at things on YouTube or on, online, it's a lot of information about the states and milder climates, which is difficult to translate for our weather, right? For them, they're like, it gets down to minus 15 Celsius at night. How are we gonna survive this thing? And that's our normal winter. Um, so cold climate heat pumps are a new technology. They just basically run at different pressures and different things like that. Uh, and they can run to almost full load all the way down to minus 30. Uh, one thing they don't talk about is the efficiencies of these things as the temperature drops, but there are some measurements that we can take to, to parameterize all that. Um, <clears throat> below these temperatures, sometimes the coil on the outside will not drop below minus 30, let's say, so we do have to shut it off because it won't transfer heat anymore. We just might as well use other source of heat like resistive heat or something else. So the backup, or the auxiliary heat, I should actually call it, um, is usually resistive strip heating, which has a COP of one, which is much less than the uh, heat pump itself. Um, but luckily, we don't spend that much time at minus 30, right? We like to think of ourselves as being in a cold climate, and it's like minus 40 all the time in Edmonton. But I have this big, complicated graph that doesn't show a whole bunch. But if we focus on the bottom line here, these are the number of hours per year we spend below minus 30. It's, this is from Blatchford data. So the international airport's a little bit more cold, but it's not that much. Some years we don't even hit minus 30. We look at like 2006, seven, but then 2008 and nine was a bit colder. But on average, we're spending about that much. This is data till 2019, because I got bored and didn't want to do the last couple of years. Um, so it's not that many hours, if you think about it. Let's say one day per year where we're under those temperatures where your heat pump cannot run at full capacity. Um, this graph shows the same data for two towns. I had high level in here, but I, I lost it. Um, so the orange line represents Cold Lake and the blue line represents Edmonton. So these are kind of the average temperatures that you'll see and how many hours were on there. If you look at the bottom, the blue line in Edmonton, we're barely passing 30. So in a place like Cold Lake, they spend more time in that colder weather. You see that little shift over? It's colder in Cold Lake than Edmonton. And if I put Leftbridge on this graph, it would shift to the right, okay? So it goes that way. So what I did is I just looked at my house. Um, my design heat loss is somewhere around 40,000 BTUs per hour uh, at minus 30, which is our design temperature here in Edmonton. And I currently have a high efficiency natural gas furnace, 95% efficiency furnace, which consumes around 104 gigajoules uh, delivered heat to my house. So I removed the domestic hot water and did other things with that. Um, I then threw my house in Leftbridge, Edmonton in high level, just for fun. I didn't actually move it, I just did it on the computer. And to see what a four ton heat pump would do. So I actually picked a particular heat pump. I'm not gonna release the brand or anything, uh, just to do this analysis. But long story short, this four ton heat pump produces 23,000 BTUs at minus 30, which is about half its full capacity at that point. So it's, it's that. The COP at minus 30 is about 1.8, so quite a bit lower than the two or three or four that are sometimes advertised for these uh, heat pumps. So the result looks like this. Um, these are the performance curves, and I don't wanna go through it too much, but as you can see, when the temperatures are warm, the COPs are high. When the temperatures are low, the COPs are, are low. The blue diagonal line represents the house uh, energy that I require. So as long as the orange line is above the blue line, that heat pump provides all the heat, no problem. But on the left side here, when it starts getting colder, you can see that the orange line drops below the blue line. I have to supplement with some other source of heat. So that could be resistive electric or dual fuel systems are sometimes used as well, where people keep their natural gas system in line. Um, so what does that mean? Well, as I said, we're not spending much time in those really cold times, even though we think we do. Um, this is sort of the results that I ended up with. So this is the total energy consumed by just for heating, so there's no hot water or cooling in here, um, for the house located in Leftbridge, Edmonton, or high level. And you can see, obviously in high level, we're cooling quite a bit, we're heating a lot more, because it's a lot colder climate, compared to Leftbridge. Um, in Edmonton, my total electricity consumed by my system is somewhere around you know, 12,000 kilowatt hours. Um, my regular annual electricity consumption is about 7,000. So that would almost triple my, my total electricity consumption for my house. Um, the COPs are quite high. So from 2.6, 2.4, and 1.8, as you get to the colder climate, 
that COP drops for the whole system because I'm relying a lot more on my electric heat. So having said that, it's not that they don't work. Where does the economics fall? What COP um, would you say works for removing the natural gas and going full electric? So those are the questions that are difficult to answer, and it's really a case-by-case -case basis. There's a huge case to talk about reducing our whole load of the building, making it more efficient, requiring less of that electricity, and then all of a sudden my smaller heat pumps can work. When I go to smaller heat pumps, two tons, one ton heat pumps, I have a lot more variation available to me as well, and I can get a lot more efficiencies with them as well. So there's a lot to talk about and a lot of nuance in this discussion. This is very, very superficial, but just to kind of show what it would look like in terms of energy consumption, okay? That number, the 2.6, 2.4, and 1.8, I would take my 104 gigajoules per year and divide it by that number for how much energy I'm actually consuming in my house. Okay, um, so that's just a quick little introduction to it. I had a lot of things to say about 200 amp versus 100, 100 amp service. We can do this with 100 amp service. We just have to be mindful of it. Um, lots of the electricians like to just, let's put 200 amp and call it a day. But even with the heat pump, we're able to do it with 100 amp service. Ducting issue, installation issues as well. These cold climate heat pumps are quite tricky to install compared to standard heat pumps. The tolerances are tighter, the, pro the pressures are a little bit higher, so you have to have a quality installer for sure. Um, I was gonna talk about condensation a bit. You can see the ice buildup under this one here. Didn't think about that. This one is a little bit better set up. And also controls to really think about. Um, just to finish off here, um, this is definitely one of the biggest questions I get asked. Do heat pumps work? Should I put a heat pump? The answer is it depends. There's no yes or no flat out. Um, if your question is just swap out my furnace for a heat pump, the answer is most likely going to be a no. You should look at envelope upgrades before going on to these types of systems. Um, I didn't explore things like hybrid systems or control options or envelope upgrades. There's lots to talk about here, uh, but that's a quick little introduction to heat pumps. Thank you. Uh, 20 minutes was fast. <laughs>